tactfulness. In the work of soul saving, great tact and wisdom are needed. The Savior never suppressed the truth, but uttered it always in love. In his intercourse with others, he exercised the greatest tact, and he was always kind and thoughtful. He was never rude, never needlessly spoke a severe word, never gave unnecessary pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censure human weaknesses. He fearlessly denounced hypocrisy, unbelief, and iniquity, but tears were in his voice as he uttered his scathing rebukes. He never made truth cruel, but ever manifested a deep tenderness for humanity. Every soul was precious in his sight. He bore himself with divine dignity, yet he bowed with the tenderest compassion and regard to every member of the family of God. He saw in all souls whom it was his mission to save. Subheading, Paul's Discretion. The minister must not feel that the whole truth is to be spoken to unbelievers on any and every occasion. He should study carefully when to speak, what to say, and what to leave unsaid. This is not practicing deception. It is working as Paul worked. Though I be free from all men, he wrote to the Corinthians, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. And to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 to 22. Paul did not approach the Jews in such a way as to arouse their prejudices. He did not at first tell them that they must believe in Jesus of Nazareth, but dwelt upon the prophecies that spoke of Christ, his mission, and his work. Step by step, he led his hearers on, showing the importance of honoring the law of God. He gave due honor to the ceremonial law, showing that it was Christ who instituted the Jewish economy and the sacrificial service. Then he brought them down to the first advent of the Redeemer and showed them that in the life and death of Christ every specification of the sacrificial service had been fulfilled. The Gentiles Paul approached by exalting Christ and then presenting the binding claims of the law. He showed how the light reflected by the cross of Calvary gave significance and glory to the whole Jewish economy. Thus the apostle varied his manner of labor, shaping his message to the circumstances under which he was placed. After patient labor, he was successful to a large degree, yet there were many who would not be convinced. Some there are today who will not be convinced by any method of presenting the truth, and the labor for God is to study carefully the best methods, that he may not arouse prejudice or combativeness. But this is where some have failed. By following their natural inclinations, they have closed doors through which they might, by a different method of labor, have found access to hearts, and through them to other hearts. God's workmen must be many-sided men, that is, they must have breadth of character. They are not to be one-idea men, stereotyped in their manner of working, unable to see that their advocacy of truth must vary with the class of people among whom they work and the circumstances they have to meet. There is delicate work for the minister to do as he meets with alienation, bitterness, and opposition. More than others, he needs that wisdom which is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. James 3.17 As the dew and the still showers fall gently upon withering plants, so his words are to fall gently when he proclaims the truth. He is to win souls, not to repulse them. He is to study to be skillful when there are no rules to meet the case. Many souls have been turned in the wrong direction and thus lost to the cause of God by lack of skill and wisdom on the part of the worker. Tact and good judgment increase the usefulness of the laborer a hundredfold. If you will speak the right words at the right time and show the right spirit, this will exert a melting power on the heart of the one he is trying to help. Subheading in new fields. 
In laboring in a new field, do not think it your duty to say at once to the people, we are Seventh-day Adventists. We believe that the seventh day is the Sabbath. We believe in the non-immortality of the soul. This would often erect a formidable barrier between you and those you wish to reach. Speak to them as you have opportunity upon points of doctrine on which you can agree. Dwell on the necessity of practical godliness. Give them evidence that you are a Christian desiring peace and that you love their souls. Let them see that you are conscientious. Thus you will gain their confidence. There will be time enough for doctrines. Let the heart be won, the soil prepared, and then sow the seed, presenting in love the truth as it is in Jesus. God will surely help those who seek him for wisdom. We are not to wait until opportunities come to us. We are to seek for opportunities, and we are to be ready always to give a reason for the hope that is in us. If the worker keeps his heart uplifted in prayer, God will help him to speak the right word at the right time. In seeking to correct or reform others, we should be careful of our words. They will be a savor of life unto life, or of death unto death. In giving reproof or counsel, many indulge in sharp, severe speech, words not adapted to heal the wounded soul. By these ill-advised expressions, the spirit is chafed, and often the erring ones are stirred to rebellion. All who would advocate the principles of truth need to receive the heavenly oil of love. Under all circumstances, reproof should be spoken in love. Then our words will reform, but not exasperate. Christ, by his Holy Spirit, will supply the force and the power. This is his work.